I think when, uh, when you choose the film, I think it was a good introduction to try to understand what will be in the future after the, these moments that you are arriving, the, the relation with the public, how these, you know, social, you know, uh, what, what, what art is, what is communicating, what is uh, everything, and how if something will change after the times you are living, because uh, uh, how we can celebrate again. And if, the, if we, uh, we can, what you say, um, surpass the past, our fears, uh, when we'll be in, uh, in this, uh, you know, again, everyone around, surrounded by the people. And at the same time, how the artists are living these moments when they cannot have audience. And that I think all artists needed audience and how they can at this moment live without that audience. How they can uh, without communicating or with a very difficult um, uh, way of communicating, and uh, that's something. Two or three points just to what to to start talking, you know, or not. And uh, I'm asking. Uh, maybe let's start with Neville. Uh, in this relation that uh, you know the artists have to expose to the. To be to to uh, confrontating with the critic, with audience, and everything. Do you think something will change afterwards, or the things will come the same? And how they live now at this moment? How they live in the present? Thank you. Um, yeah, for sure. I mean, I think i think what what we're going through and continue to go through is going to change the way not just arts produced but the way that arts consumed um you know maybe it's too grandiose to say that it's a paradigm shift but i think it is um i think artists have to rethink audiences um I mean, so certainly within the museum sector, within institutional institutions, um, it's going to be very hard to come back to the kind of histories and presentations that we've had before. Um, my interest has been, been in site-specific art, in art that's outside of institutions. So in a way, that's, that's, that's COVID-resistant. Um, and I think... I think that's, you know, we're going to see more of that. I think we're going to see more um, art production and art presentation that takes place outside of the boundaries of institutions. So I think, you know, I don't know what's, what, whether that's true of cinema or of, of, of theater, but I think, I think anyway within, the, within the, the art world that I've been interested in, which is really predicated on land art, um, on, on, on an experiment to take out art outdoors and, and, and out of the confines of the institution. You know, I think, I think that's, that's going to continue. Um, and I think, I think there's going to be a greater emphasis on uh, experiential art. Um, on, on, on forms that don't, uh, don't have to exist within enclosed spaces. Um, and I think, and, and th those kinds of enclosures, I think, are going to change anyway, and, and, and not just physical enclosures and architectural enclosures, but mental enclosures. Um, so I think, I, think, I think people are thinking about uh, 
new forms of distribution within the art world. And, 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 and we spent a lot of time, you know, with the, the, last, the last century has really, it's been distributed through these, through these physical and architectural institutions. I believe that for the next, you know, for the, the next decades will be marked by a different kind of distribution where art is actually outside in the world um, and participatory in a different way. I'm not sure that answers your question. Uh, Marie-Laure, do you have something to say about it? Uh, first of all, my dear Paolo, I wanted to thank you to have invited us to be able to organize this festival. I think it's already a miracle. And coming from France, suddenly we were like birds out of the cage with not a true life, but more like a real life. Second, I was, was so upset and moved by the film, <laughs> The Carrosse d'Or, which I have seen a long time ago, and I think it was so relevant to the situation between art, theater, and life, and the power of art. So it made me cry, really, really. So now I will speak of my own experience, because I represent the institution, museum, collection of modern and contemporary art, so I was curator of several exhibitions. I would say a few things, the situation is catastrophic for artists, especially for artists, not for us as curator, even if it's difficult. I think it's much more difficult for artists, for creators, who has worked so much for an exhibition, for a performance, for music. So it's evident, catastrophic. But we have seen since the first knockout, confinement, we say in French, that there was a lot of manners to invent other presentation and diffusion of art uh, by video, by a lot of uh, technologic new ways. There was a huge creativity and I am very, in a way, optimist because in every crisis, war and historical and social economic catastrophe, uh, catastrophic situation. I think the artists react very much to the situation and are able, even if it's difficult, to invent new form of, uh, of creating, of diffusing, of being always artists. They cannot stop anyway. I remember that during the Spanish flu, for example, which was a huge a pandemic in the beginning of the century. The art was going on always, always. So that's one of the points. The other point about museum, uh, there was always this blockbuster exhibition. Everybody thinks that we need to make huge exhibition, that the museum, they need more and more audience, more and more people. When I work in the Louvre, for example, the only thing that all the direction, everybody said, how millions of visitors, and it became a nightmare. Nobody was able to see the, the works of art. So there was something very strange between this pandemia and lockout to go in the museum and there was nobody. So suddenly, even when it was open, September and October, the museum was empty. So what does it mean? So does the people, they really want to go to see the real works or they don't mind? And, to see on uh, video and on screen is it enough? So I think the big question is between, between uh, the real work of art with the uh, hand, with the author, and the reproduction. So it's an old, very old question, uh, which was uh, always uh, in the uh, question of art. Do we need to see the real picture, to go to the museum to see the real picture, or do we can see just with the phone, mobile, or on a screen. And I think this pandemic reflects the situation which has already begun, that we go more and more on virtual, virtual representation of work of art, virtual cinema, virtual theater, between theater and cinema. So perhaps this tendency will go more and more. So I just want to add another thing. Uh, for my generation, it's kind of impossible, impossible. 
because I am old generation, like a boomer. And for me to go to the museum, to see the real work, to see the actor on the real stage, to have the body, to have the hand, I think it's so important. But I must think that my grandson, for example, I think he does not mind at all. For him, it's quite the same way to see on an image, on the screen, he can learn so much by uh, virtual. I'm not sure that he needs, uh, he has a real need like me to be in touch. Uh, it's not uh, hazard that we are not able to touch, that we have not this relation body to body, hand to hand. It's already a premise, I'm afraid, of the new world. So there is a lot of contradiction and paradoxal question about this new situation for tomorrow, for art. And uh, for example, to go back to the museum, they have wonderful collection. Now Pompidou, the, all the FRAC, all the big institution was huge collection. They have to be concentrated on that collection because they have no money and not able to make big exhibitions like Blockbuster because on uh, ecologic way it's very bad to, uh, traveling and very expensive. And so it's why they have a lot of storage now when you can go and see the collection without uh, depending huge work. So that means we have to go uh, Politic of culture, less is more. You are not obliged to make so many exhibitions. You can be less, with less expensive for its exhibition. So that's one of the solution for museum, for example. Yeah. But I think for a moment the massification of you know of the, these expositions and everything will change a little bit. But for me, I had uh, just another thought. For years, I wanted to go back because I think it was 50 years ago that I, uh, I was in the Palais des Doges in, uh, in Venice. Uh, and the last time I was there, two months ago, for the first time I could go, nobody was there. And I spent uh, I don't know how many hours seeing it without anyone because the tourism was not anymore, you know, at least I took advantage of this moment, you know, to go back to some, a place that normally I could not go because I cannot stand, you know, all this massification, but you don't have time to anything, to see anything. But anyway, this is one of the aspects that something will change. I think at the same time that we cannot, <coughs> you cannot have the same feeling seeing the, 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 the painters and all these art, art, uh, art creation, if you are not present in front of them only by, you know, through the new ways of, uh, of seeing it. Now, and I think that changed a little bit. I don't know what is better or not, but that is something that is not for me to analyze that. But uh, for someone like uh, Nidia, you are in your, uh, you know, work now, in your, you know, uh, way of, uh, you know, of creating and communicating everything, you know, uh, I would like you to talk us about your experience at these moments and exactly if something would change or you think that something will change in the in the in the in the next future, we hope that will be very soon. Um, with these all these conditions that we have now and we have afterwards, can you say something about? Yes, certainly. Um, so, just for some context, I'm an independent artist and researcher, and I've worked in conjunction with institutions and um, universities and different types of organisations. Uh, in project-based work, um, and I agree that uh, it is a paradigm shift, and if it's not, it's because we didn't make it one. Um, something that I have noticed is a, a sudden interest in, I primarily work in experiential, experimental means. Um, some of it is relational, some of it is performance-based. Um, the works I've done, just the last three works I've done in the last uh, four months are perfect examples one, I did three days of one-to-one -one experiential work, basically morning to night. Um, 
another one I performed inside a inside a, a basically a shop front, uh, so that for social distancing, people could stand on the street and observe it and move through. And it was nine minutes, so they didn't uh, overstay that time period. Uh, and most recently, in, an, in a group exhibition, to take people through five people at a time um, and seal off all different parts of a building to take those five people through an exhibition. I mean, this is labor. It's a, it's a huge increase in labor, but what it brings your attention to is the urgency um, to provide spaces where people can enter and engage with alternate forms of making meaning during a time in which there is so much uncertainty. Um, I also think the subject matter that people are interested in has shifted uh, quite, quite distinctly. Um, and when I, we, when I think about the idea of a paradigm shift and, uh, and the role of the institution in this sort of changing atmosphere, um, for me, I, I start to think, well, what is the role of an artist in this type of a world? If it is not, I mean, we saw in this film this, this quite traditional role of the artist as an entertainer. And I can understand that for a lot of institutions, the, the big question is about how to sustain um, their, their business model as well as their engagement with the public. Um, but I think what we're seeing now is that there's an urgency to engage with the public that is in dire trauma and is in um, a very, very uncertain space of articulating their own identity. And a lot of experiential relational work is emerging and is in demand to help people make sense of um, really a, a time that we have not experienced in our contemporary history before. So, uh, yes, it's... That's one of the, the noticings that I've had. And the interest of cooperative institutions, I mean, now is a time where we're seeing a lot more collaboration between various types of organizations that hasn't happened before uh, for the same, with, with the same speed and with the same um, intention. For, for the projects that I, I just recently done, we had a community cooperative and a university and a collaborative institution in the Four Seas Project, a European cooperation funded program, come together around um, a, a community association and create this space for, for mediation and for the public to, to engage um, in a very personal, very intimate, very resource <laughs> um, intensive way. Um, so I think that that sort of a, a sacrifice and that sort of a, a shift in a mindset. What is the role of an artist now? Why are people seeking these spaces, particularly when uh, in the Western world we don't have the same spaces to deal with um, the, the trauma or the sense-making or the absolute entropy that we're witnessing? We don't have a space to go for that. And when people enter a museum or they enter a workshop or they enter a performance, they're giving themselves that little bit of time to suspend their ideas of what came, comes outside of that space. That's, that's really the opportunity we have. Um, and I think a lot of uh, both artists, researchers, whatever types of humans they want to call themselves are suddenly activating because there's this urgency there. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll park it there for now. <laughs> uh, just to go on on these, um points that you just uh, say, Bernard, uh, do you think that, you know, time to time, something that, that happens like that, moments, so at the at same time, that we have to, uh, you know, to be confronted with situations that we never expected, they are needed for us and for all the creation and everything to, to in a way, to, to react and to be in, in something that sometimes are already too obvious, you know, and uh, oblige us to confront it and ourselves, like artists, like uh, culture agents, like uh, everyone, we have to to be, uh, in a way, ready to change something because 
like all of us, you know, I think we have the same point. Never we stop, never, we'll never stop the creation and uh, the thing don't, but any, we have to react to this. Do you think sometimes can be, cannot say positive, but something that uh, uh, makes us give uh, what, uh, un pas en avant, something, go further. Sorry, I, I will speak in, in, in French because, uh, because my, uh, my English is so bad. Mais je pense que tu as raison, Paolo, d'abord merci de cette invitation qui est importante dans ce moment assez, je dirais pas tragique, mais un moment fort, un moment, un moment, un, un moment inédit en tout cas depuis dans ce, dans ce 20e siècle. Donc merci d'avoir passé ce film en introduction, c'est un film incroyable que je n'avais en réalité jamais vu, je crois. Et c'est un film qui pose évidemment la question du vrai, du faux, de l'art, de la réalité et du pouvoir, effectivement, Marie-Laure l'a dit, du pouvoir de l'art. Effectivement, nous qui sommes du côté de l'art, alors nous, nous sommes plutôt du côté de, des écrivains, des organisateurs, des gens qui... qui euh, euh, nous ne sommes pas... Des, nous, notre mode de création est, est un peu spécifique. Nous sommes sans doute un petit peu moins touchés que les artistes eux-mêmes, mais nous sommes en charge devant cette pandémie. Nous sommes en charge évidemment de changer les choses. Tu as raison de dire, ça ne peut pas, ça ne peut pas désormais le monde et le monde de l'art particulièrement ne peut pas, ne peut pas se dérouler comme avant. Euh, cette pandémie nous oblige à, à, nous, à, à regarder ce que nous avons fait et les limites de ce que nous avons fait. Je crois que Marie-Laure a parlé de ces grands blockbusters euh, du, euh, par exemple dans les musées je crois que cette, cette, cette pandémie va nous obliger à revenir à des fondamentaux à une manière de faire les expositions et de penser l'art autrement à être moins, euh, moins, dans le, moins dans le spectaculaire je crois qu'au fond cette, cette pandémie va nous obliger à nous, à nous à nous concentrer à nouveau sur, euh, sur ce que nous avons à faire, sur peut-être sur les questions beaucoup plus artistiques, à penser, à, à être plus... Je pense que les décennies précédentes ont, été, ont déplacé l'art du côté de la communication. Or Deleuze, on, on, on le sait, a, a toujours dit que l'art, ce n'était pas de la communication, et que l'art avait quelque chose qui met, même allait contre la communication. Et je crois que peut-être cette pandémie va nous obliger à revenir à l'art et à abandonner peut-être la question qui était trop forte de l'art comme communication. L'art doit... L'art, c'est quelque chose qui pose des problèmes. Ce n'est pas quelque chose... On ne communique rien en art. Il n'y a pas de... On ne, au fond, ça, c'était une, une illusion de dire que l'art avait quelque chose à dire. L'art n'a peut-être pas, pas, pas à dire quelque chose. Il a à faire quelque chose. Et ça, je crois que cette idée que maintenant nous avons à faire et que cette pandémie nous oblige à faire et à, nous, et à faire autrement, je crois que c'est ça qui, euh, que je trouve très important dans cette, dans cette situation. Donc, je crois que euh, cette pandémie, elle est, très, elle, est, elle est incroyable, elle tombe d'une certaine manière à un moment où nous allions trop loin. Nous allions trop... Alors, je ne veux pas dire que cette pandémie, c'est quelque chose qui... Euh, Ce n'est pas, pas la justice divine qui est tombée avec cette maladie pour... Euh, effectivement, je, je, je ne veux pas avoir cette, cette, cette vision-là. Mais moi, je dis quand même, il faut que nous saisissions la chance. Il faut que nous fassions de cette maladie une chance pour revenir aux fondamentaux de l'art. Euh... Meryl, we have something to say? <laughs> or, I know you are in contact. We have someone that is in, in permanent contact with, uh, with the artists, you know. And, uh, and I would like to know if, uh, uh, more or less, you know, if they are uh, in their work day by day, if something has really changed or they still going and uh, knowing that 
you know, the relation with the, 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 the you know, the, the, the public and the, will be different. But in their creation, do you feel some something change or nothing is changed? It's, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think things have changed for sure, but but I think, but I think what what what's COVID what COVID's done is 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 reveal the cracks that are already in the system, and that that applies to you know whether it's social justice or or, or art production that that's that's true across the board. I mean, you know, we're we're in this era now, where, which is which is very difficult to sort of find a map of of, of of where we're going and what might happen, but you know, if one if one just rewinds the clock to the to the moment immediately prior to to the advent of COVID, you know, everyone was complaining about the art industrial complex. Um, there was too much art. You know, there was a turnstile model, the block, blockbuster shows, the galleries were complaining because they were having to sell so much and it was so laborious and it meant traveling around the world and all this kind of stuff. So it's, it, it's, it's, not, as if, it's, it's not as if COVID has come from nowhere and kind of affected this paradigm shift. The system, was, the system was breaking before COVID. COVID has just revealed the cracks in the system. At least, at least that's my opinion. And I think for, 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 for some artists there's been there's been some relief to that, you know. Um, I think it's it's allowed practices to become much more local. Um, I think it's allowed people to reconstitute audiences, um, and you know, there's there 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 are lots of models for for artworks that um, have a different kind of audience. Um, you know, beginning with say. You know, land art, which was remote and 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 entered the public domain through this sort of mythological ap apparatus. Um, or another example would be something like my favorite example was was is the the Pink Floyd concert of 1972 live in Pompeii. You know, where the, where where Pink Floyd played to the winds and the ruins. There was no audience. There were just some ro road roadies. Um, and you know that became their most well-known, their most viewed concert. In fact, so I think there are all sorts of ways of, 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 of reconstituting audiences within this new world that are exciting and involve new types of mythologies, and, and don't involve this this um, this idea of a sort of uh, global institutional apparatus, you know, what, what we would call the art industrial complex. And you need it, you have some, you know, the experience, not only yours, but to other, uh, other artists that you know, if they are, uh, you know, is still this desire of, of, you know, with this force going on all the time, or something there are points of interrogation what's in their work about what, what they have to do and how to do it and everything, if something really changed or not. I think, uh, so I'm um, Australian I'm a citizen and so my community in Australia uh, lives in Melbourne, which actually had a five-month lockdown. Um, they, they were confined to their homes for a lot longer than other parts of the world. And the, the thing that f from the first lockdown and then that I witnessed through till just a few weeks ago they got out is that uh, the artist had to dismantle. The, the artist was, they, they found themselves questioning what, why, how, what other opportunities I have been chasing, what have been the horizons, who am I? You know, of course, this question of a lot of people are in this existential crisis, but for artists, um, for the lucky ones at least, I think it served as a huge realignment, and a lot of them uh, completely dismantled their, their way of working and had to find something that was a practice that allowed them to survive, not just financially, but uh, intellectually, um, you know, in, at the essence of what their query was, and 
uh, yes, I mean, I, I don't want to discount the fact that it was very difficult for a lot of artists and that there has been um, this, uh, a lot of damage that's been done as well. But I think that most artists have had to had, have, have a very serious uh, contemplation of what their purpose is within their practice and whether that is a commercial uh, and an extroverted purpose or where that line is between their internal query and how that serves um, a community or how that connects to something wider than themselves. So there's been a lot of, uh, a lot more, um, like you said, that this, this next generation taking this digital, digital means to a new level um, projects that really start to, to bring speculative fiction into a practice across different digital networks, um, projects that start to, to question, again, what does it mean for a dancer to be performing alone in their room? What does it mean um, for a practice to be occurring without an audience? And, and where does that, that, where is the worth of that in developing a new framework for how we, we view the arts and view the role of the arts in the world as well? about that project, Passing Time, that you and other people put on. Uh, could you tell us a bit about it? Because it's, uh, it's, it was a response to uh, the situation we were living. Yeah, sure. But um, unfortunately, we cannot show it because... It, but uh, we'd, show it. we'd show it. It's an online project. So um, it, exists, it, it exists online. It's... it's the title of the project is Passing Time. Um, it's passing, passing underscore time. Um, started it with three people, with, with Cecilia, who's here, Bengalia, and um, Alex Perlweiler. And, and I think the, the idea was, it's a series of, of, of artist films that we, we commissioned. I mean, we didn't commission, we, we, we just invited. We created this platform. It's, uh, and invited people to submit short works um, between one and two minutes long that reflected what they were doing and their activities during, during the post-COVID. It started right in, 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 in March and is, is, is continuing now. Um, and I think one of the interests for us was, uh, you know, what... what I mean, I grew up in a post-punk era. Um, you know, the, the, the sort of uh, idea of music being three chords and anyone can do it. So what I was interested in part was, was uh, what, what artists would do when they suddenly didn't have this, this apparatus of the studio um, and, the, and, and assistance and were really left, uh, in most cases, just with a phone. Um, so most of the, most of the, a lot of the works on it are just made by artists filming. Um, it's, it's not curated in any sense. It's, it's driven by a randomizer. Um, so there's no hierarchy. There are no uh, artists' names. There's, there's an index of artists' names, but they're not attached to the work. So um, it was meant to be, to create a sort of, uh, anti-hierarchical space um, in which anyone could submit work, um, certainly not curated. And um, I think it was the, the idea was to just create a, a, a sort of, um, an, a, a, one, a, a living archive of, of, of what people would, are doing at this moment or during confinement. Um, and in some ways document it, but without uh, the priority being on the author. So, um, yeah, I mean, you should check it out online. Uh, what I can propose now that Anne Zulbich sent us a video of 14 minutes. I didn't see it yet, I'll just to change. receive it. And, uh, uh, yes, yes uh, just to go back a little, uh, for me personally as a curator, this year I had three exhibitions, one of uh, William Kentridge, who just opened for one month, one of uh, Cindy Sherman, both was uh, supposed to be open on 1st of April, 
So everything was ready and cancelled. And uh, there was another one about Picasso poets in Musée Picasso. So I have the experience as curator to have work to make a catalogue and suddenly no more exhibition. So it opened one month in September, but the artist Cindy Sherman, she couldn't come. William Kentridge was back in uh, Johannesburg and he sent us a wonderful small film, one minute, one film. That means he was alone in his studio. And I realized at this time, like artists like Kentridge, like Annette Messager, it was a very creative period for them. They were closed in their studio, but they are able either to draw or either to make a film, and it was diffused. There is something I am very afraid of, uh, because it's a way to react to his internet, to make exhibition online, to make sale online, to have this distance. But that means you receive art alone. That means become completely individual. There is no more collective, there is no more communion. And I think the space where you see a work, to speak with somebody, to look at a film, to look at an exhibition with somebody, is essential. So I hope that in a few, several months, one year after the vaccine, we will be able to find back all this way to look at art. We cannot stay in a kind of individual, just by internet and a screen. I'm sure we will need again to have our body in front of a scene, in front of a picture. So that does not mean go back exactly to the same way, because as we said, we have to change economic, we have to change of ecologic level, about travel, about everything. But I think the relation of art can be different, can be better in a way, as I say, more economic, a different way of diffusion, but we have to keep the, the real. You have to keep the real. The relation, uh, human relations. The you human and the real thing. Yeah. Uh, I, I propose to see the, the, uh, the, what Anne sent to us, and after, maybe he will pose some questions or some things that we can discuss afterwards. Hello, bon dia. Good morning, everyone. It is great to see you, and thank you so much to Paolo Branco for the invitation to speak here today. I hope to be with you all soon in real life next year. Today it is virtual and um, I wanted to just say also what an honor it is to be part of Paolo's festival. Artists always tell me about this festival and I think with institutions it's the same with museum. It's so important institutions where artists feel a strong belonging and clearly Paolo has with this festival created such a structure which artists are very very passionate about. I wanted to talk today about the future and I think uh, the future always flies in under the radar. So it's difficult to speak about the future, but I think we can talk about the extreme present as, yeah, the extreme present as we actually try to summarize it or try to address it in the book we did with Shumon Bazaar and also Douglas Copeland. And um, one of the things today I want to, to, to mention and to actually tell you all is about thinking with Edouard Lisson, thinking the present with Edouard Lisson. I have a ritual every day to read 50 minutes of Edouard Lisson. The late Edouard Lisson was my friend and mentor and really an inspiration for everything I do. So I wanted to share that with you. And talking about rituals, it connects actually to cinema because my favorite film director, Andrei Tarkovsky, always said we need more rituals, that our world, our society is bereft of rituals. Hence, the necessity to reintroduce or reinvent new rituals. And I have many of them. One is that I would wake up early in the morning and de-link. Um, so I wouldn't be online for the first hour of the day. I wouldn't check email. I wouldn't basically make any phone calls. I wouldn't go on websites. I would just de-link. Uh, de-linking is important. And I would handwrite in a notebook ideas for the day, notes, uh, texts, writing, and then the day would move on. I also have another ritual, which is to read Edouard Lisson for 15 minutes when I wake up. Another ritual is to buy a book every day, and that, of course, leads us to the idea of the reading list, which is important in terms of the lockdown. We are here again in lockdown in, in, in London. I don't know about, about Portugal, but London has uh, the second lockdown now, and so uh, that, of course, 
means reading also, more reading and reading lists are important during the lockdown. So I wanted to recommend, recommend everyone the book, the amazing book by Alexis Pauling Gamps. Uh, it's a book from a trilogy and it's a book called Dub. And Alexis talks about actually a friend of Edouard Glissant, Sylvia Winter. And it's actually not a book about Sylvia Winter, but it's a book, Dub, D-U-B, is a book about thinking with Sylvia Winter. As Alexis Pollingham says, we have the opportunity now as a species fully in touch with each other through social media to unlearn and relearn our own patterns of thinking and storytelling in a way that allows us to be actually in communion with our environment, as opposed to a dominating colonialist separation from the environment. And that seems to be one of the most urgent points, I think, of our of our current moment. We try to address this with our exhibition Back to Earth at the uh, Serpentine Gallery. Sylvia Winter says what we need is a socio-poetics. Poetics for the society we need, poetics of a possible relation, right? The situation we have, she explains, is one of separation, the dominant story, and the languages in which we reproduce it say that we are not related. Our relationships to people and environment are mediated by capital and violence. So what it really is about is about building these relationships to environment and to people. And the question how we can do that also through art, through exhibitions, through festivals, uh, seems to be very central. It of course also means to think about how we can build such relations over time. So it means also, uh, and that is important in relation to the environmental question, how we can go beyond this idea of event culture, how we can think about longer term formats, no? how, how we can think about long durational formats and uh, not just um, an event of a week or a month, uh, maybe something which lasts for 10 or 20 or 50 years. No? This idea of how we can actually liberate also from maybe a short termism seems important. Then of course, technology. Uh, in our time, how can we think about technology? And Billy Kluver actually um, developed the experiments in art and technology. I think today we can think about what would be the new experiments in art and technology. And these new experiments in art and technology um, would connect, I think, to what Nam Jun Paik said in the 1960s, because Nam Jun Paik says that it is and he did his global live satellite broadcast. He really came up with amazing new formats. He said, the question is how we can actually liberate the poetic and intercultural capacities of technologies. And that is something um, which is, of course, interesting today. If we think about art with AR and VR and AI, many of these experiments, thinking, for example, what we recently did with Ian Chang. Ian Chang is an artist who liberates us from this idea also of the moving image being in a loop. It's no longer a loop. It's in that sense, um, a living organism. It's an artwork which has a central nervous system. Bob, bag of beliefs, has a central nervous system. Um, and in this sense, a living organism. It's an artwork which has a central nervous system. Bob, bag of beliefs, has a central nervous system. Um, and in this sense, um, it's a very different experience than we would have it is with moving image with a very different experience than we would have had actually with a film. Because whenever we encounter the work, it's changed, it's different. It never will repeat twice. Um, I think uh, the other aspect, of course, is how we can come up with formats also. Because now, of course, with these broadcasts and also, um, uh, yes, yeah, screens. Yeah, right now happens on our phone screens or laptop screens. How can we actually go beyond these two dimensions, no? And think about three dimensions. Also, again, Pike, you think about the intercultural poetic capacities, how we can sort of go beyond the two dimensions of, 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 the, of the screens, no? And I think in a way, these participatory format bring us also back to an old project of mine called Do It. Um, and with Do It, we actually have uh, a project where artists write instructions, recipes, how-to manuals. It has happened in 165 cities so far, and it's very much about learning. It's about growing. 
And uh, in that sense, you know, it brings us to, to Edouard Glissant, because one of the things I learned from Edouard Glissant, we live in a world of uh, ho homogenized globalization. This is not the first time the world does experience globalization, but it is without a doubt the most extreme and maybe also most violent form of globalization. So I think we need in our time to, with exhibitions, with festivals, to think how we can resist the, the homogenized form of globalization and find a new dialogue between the local and the global, how we can listen. Um, and yet at the same time, uh, Glissau said we should not only resist the homogenized forms of globalization, but we should also be aware that there is a counter-reaction building up, and he said that many, many decades ago, uh, a counter-reaction building up to this globalization, which is a new form of localism, new forms of nationalism, new forms of lack of solidarity. And he said, you know, how important it is to resist that as well. In the words of the late Bernard Stiegler, comment pouvons-nous être uh, local sans être localist? No, how can we be local without being localists? And this danger we face right now in the world is something which has only, I think, deteriorated during the time of the lockdown. There is an increased form of nationalism in the world. And Grissant said we need to go beyond that, build up relations, dialogue. So he said we need mondialité, we need a global dialogue um, which resists both homogenized globalization and its counter-reaction. And um, I think, again, that's what exhibitions and festivals hopefully can, can what art, yeah, can make a contribution to. And we do it, we've tried to listen to Glissant and come up with a model which tries to do exactly that. So the exhibition is never twice the same. And uh, artists write these recipes, these instructions, and then they are locally interpreted. But also new instructions by artists where the show takes place are being added. So it's a never growing organic archive of so far more than 400 instructions. And of course, it's fascinating that during the lockdown, during the first lockdown, many people have turned to do it during quarantine whilst actually physical mobility was and now again is restricted, art, of course, can be a way to experience life beyond one's immediate circumstances, right? So whether through paint or words or music or food or another medium, artists of all kinds guide their audiences to change their worlds. So do it is in that sense an open invitation for anyone to let art expand their horizons. I also wanted to launch a new idea today because actually this morning, when I prepared the speech, uh, I was thinking that maybe one could one day do a do it, uh, a, such a, a do it project with filmmakers for, for do it yourself films. So that basically filmmakers could give recipes, open scores, instructions, how to make a film and people all over the world with their phones could do it. And I just wanted to suggest that to Paolo, maybe we could collaborate on that because I think it would be an incredible thing to do a do-it version with, uh, with film. Last but not least, I think uh, the question is also, if we think about all these changes and if we think about what Glissant says for our time, this of course also means we need new institution. And I've been thinking uh, about Glissant as a poet, as a philosopher, as a public intellectual, lecturer, as a curator, not only encompassing literary and theoretical work, but actually consistently this idea of producing reality, right? This idea that, for example, he was a member of the resistance who spoke out in favor of Martin Nick's independence. So that was a first time he went clearly beyond the space of books into reality. But then in 67, he not only wrote about the necessity of new education, but actually did it. He founded the Institut Martiniquet d'Etudes, a school which was an agent for change, which intervened in political issues, and most importantly, which implemented Creole as a language into a school system in Martinique, which had completely was dominated by, by French. But what makes Glissant, in terms of production of reality, so relevant for today is actually also his unrealized project, because he imagined a prepared a museum for Martinique, which is unrealized, but where he collaborated very closely with, with Fredo Lam, with uh, many artists, friends, Segui, Antonio Segui, and imagined the museum as an archipelago. So an archipelago, which would not house a synthesis, but a network of interrelationships. And I think actually that's interesting, not only in terms of a museum, but also in terms of a festival. I think actually Paolo's festival is that, is a is an archipelago. 
It's, it's not about the synthesis, but it's about a network of interrelationships. Glissant wanted to create a museum to come back to this idea, which would not only point at urgencies, but also find agency to respond to these urgencies. He imagined it to be a quivering place which transcends established systems of thoughts and which is looking for the utopian point where all the worlds, cultures and all the world's imaginations can meet and hear one another. And that's for me the most important definition of what an art institution can be in the 21st century, right? The idea of being a quivering place of transcending established systems of thoughts, of looking for the utopian point where all the world's cultures and all the world's imaginations can meet and hear one another. Last but not least, I wanted to conclude with another unrealized project, actually, from which we can learn of an art institution, and that's John Littlewood and actually Cedric Price and their fun palace, which they invented in the late, in the, in the actually late 50s, early 60s, yeah. And it was John Littlewood, who is a pioneer of street theater, wanted to blur down the boundaries between institutions and the city, something which of course is very important for us also at the Serpent Time with our project with the uh, community in Barking Dagenham, the Radio Ballads, where we invite artists actually into Barking Dagenham as a residency, it's again a long-term project. So yeah, so John Littlewood wanted to break down the boundaries between the theatre and the city, and at the same time Cedric Price as an architect with John wanted to design such an institution. And they defined this idea of the Fan Palace as a 21st century institution which would utilize calculated uncertainty and conscious incompleteness to produce a catalyst for invigorating change whilst always producing the harvest of the quiet eye. And I think that's a beautiful definition again also for a festival. If you think about this idea, no, to utilize calculated uncertainty and conscious incompleteness to produce a catalyst for invigorating change whilst always producing the harvest of the quiet eye. Thank you all so much and see you soon. Bye. What he said about this conscious uncertainty is a really big, I think that's, that's how I heard it, is a really important thing. Um, it's interesting that this conversation we're having is, oh, what do we think we will change next? We don't, maybe we don't need to know what it will change into, just that we're changing and it's going to be ambiguous for some time. And, and with uh, this consciousness of, of decoloniality that needs to happen, this consciousness that the free market economics is finally dismantling in this, you know, quite, a, again, absurd sort of surreal way, is that perhaps the most powerful thing we can do is to start creating and, and allowing and holding spaces of ambiguity where we're also able to say, I don't know, I will we'll open the doors, we will create the works, but we don't know if they're going to work and that's, that's okay, we can concede defeat uh, or you know, concede uh, a surrender or a welcoming to that type of ambiguity. Something that stood out, if you wanted to add. <laughs> No, I, th I mean, I think that's absolutely right. Um, yeah, I mean, to, uh, I, in a way, I think, I, I think you're right to say that, that we have to just keep ourselves, remain open to, to possibility. Um, funny enough, in, in the Abel Ferrara movie we just watched last night, one of the things that I took out of it was, was where, where he talked about Bobby Fischer and, and chess and, 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 and um, recounted this time that, that someone had asked Bobby Fischer about, who was obviously the great uh, grandmaster of chess, you know, what, what he was thinking about in terms of psychology, the psychology of the game, the psychology of the opponent, all of this, this kind of stuff, and, 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 and the future. And, and his response was, I'm not. I'm thinking about the next move. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the project I was speaking about where I had one-to-one -one interactions, um, at the start of the year it was conceived as like 20 people in a session and it became this very intimate thing. And so what we did was we invited people to bring in an object from their experience of uh, lockdown, which the people went through an audio experience to get this object. And I expected and was putting this pressure on myself that 
they would go through this process and something would, would happen or they would resolve it. And I found that for a lot of people, it was just to have a space in which they could be in this stuckness or in this quandary or a space where it could be uh, unresolved. And even that, even giving that space, again, to just be present with the, the unresolvable um, provided some sense of relief or some sense of being able to, to move onwards from that place, even if me or them didn't know what had transpired between us. Um, so I Very like the well. metaphor. Uh, I'm sorry because I'm not sure I have really understood all the speech of Hans Ulrich. I don't know if the sound of was not so easy for me to understand everything. So I imagine knowing him a little that he, because he speak about Edouard Glisson, and of course there was a question of globalization in the art and all the bad effect of too much globalization. And I'm very surprised that I didn't hear nobody speaking about ecology, about protecting um, our environmental challenge. And of course, in the new change of world of art, it's very indispensable to change our way of uh, traveling, too much traveling, too much exhibition all around the world, too much sale, too much biennial. So, as I think the artist must go on travel a lot. All the artist has to travel and produce where they're invited. But perhaps he, if we are obliged to make a lot of economy of flight, of travel, and we will be obliged. There is a protection of Earth, which is re connected very deeply with the change in art. I'm sure we are obliged. So I just want to say that perhaps the work of art, of humanism, are not obliged to travel so much because it's so expensive or quite nothing, and to keep the essential travel of the artist who has to go around the world. So I, I am very surprised because generally on Tulrich he speaks about this challenge of um, ec ecology and uh, environmental protection of the earth, and I think it is one of the challenge for the future of the world of art. Okay, Bernard. Uh, I have a problem for I have a lot of uh, difficulties to uh, to understand Hans Ulrich. I, I know him very well, but <laughs> but he's uh, Hans Ulrich, uh, Edouard Glissant. C'est le monde, le nouveau mentor, the new mentor of Hans Ulrich. Uh, uh, C'est un c'est un esprit important. Aujourd'hui, je crois effectivement de, de lire, de lire la pensée de d'Edouard de, de, Glissant, la, la, la notion d'archipel, la notion de surtout de euh, créolisation. de créolisation. Euh, C'est quelqu'un qui a pensé, qui pense le monde d'aujourd'hui, qui a pensé le monde d'aujourd'hui, qui le pense et qui continue à le penser. Donc, c'est assez important. Et c'est vrai que cette pandémie, cette pandémie nous oblige évidemment à, 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 penser, à, à penser, oui, autrement, et, et peut-être à inventer encore, encore. Il faudrait que on a inventé quelque chose d'autre, dont on, dont on ne sait pas très bien ce que c'est. Je crois qu'il y a, qu'il y a quelque chose qui est au devant de nous là. Cette pandémie va nous obliger à penser autrement et à donc à imaginer peut-être d'autres mots encore que créolisation, que mondialisation, enfin que créolisation, que archi, arch, archipélisation. Peut-être que nous avons un, que ça va nous obliger à inventer d'autres 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 manières de faire le monde, de faire les mondes. Ça c'est vraiment, je crois que nous, nous être un artiste, être 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 dans l'art, c'est vraiment penser euh, un autre monde. Penser, euh, et je crois, je, je crois que c'est, je crois que c'est notre responsabilité. Thank you, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Nidia and Steve.